Hey, thanks for joining us today. My name is Adam Zilka with Fire Gang Dental Marketing. Um, I am here with the uh, with the owner of Branding for the People. Um, is it is it Ray? Do I Ray. Ray. Ray with a long A. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Um, okay. uh, Ray Prez, and uh, this is uh, for the, the the Dental Growth Summit. Um, so uh, basically, thanks for joining us today, Ray. Um, Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Um, so can you kind of kick off a little bit about your company, who you are, what you do at a high level, and then I'll kind of dig into some, some specific questions about it? Yeah, sure. So I'm a brand strategist. Uh, my background, I've worked with some of the top global branding firms working with Fortune 500 brands and sort of uh, my, I have a 25-year career in branding uh, doing just that. Uh, seven years ago, I decided to go off on my own and I kind of lost the passion with working with Fortune 500 brands and I decided to help smaller businesses uh, and entrepreneurs to get access to the same level of Fortune 500 level thinking so that they can create memorable, profitable brands just like the big guys. So that's, you know, the agency I came up with that uh, seven years ago, the concept of branding for the people. Uh, and um, seven years later, we're now a, a full service, uh, nine person team agency and growing um, and serving thousands of entrepreneurs across 45 different industries around the globe. Wow, awesome, exciting. So tell me, what is brand? You know, I like starting with this question. Thank you for asking because before everyone can hear the rest of this conversation, you kind of have to understand these terms because when I came into the space seven years ago, people were referring to brand as their logo or their tagline or their website or the name of their company. And these are all important and valuable things in creating a brand. However, uh, the definition that I've been used in my career uh, is that brand is a desired perception. Okay. And and so if brand is a desired perception, you don't own your brand, it resides in the minds of the people that you're communicating to. And so therefore branding is the process of creating, shaping and influencing that desired perception. Now this is distinct from marketing because marketing is just one vehicle out of several other vehicles like communications and PR and advertising and design that are all designed to help create that desired perception. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, very, very interesting. So like if you could elaborate um, maybe a little bit more, explain if you can, I guess a little bit more in depth as to how, how branding is different than marketing. Than like, marketing? Yeah. So you wanna look at it this way. So, you know, you, I'll put marketing and advertising in, in a broad category. Marketing and, adverti and advertising by definition is designed to get someone's attention now. Right. Uh, when you're, whether you're talking about online marketing or offline marketing, but it's to get someone to take an action, whether it's to opt in, to uh, uh, follow you, or to subscribe, or whatever the, the, uh, the behavior is that you want. It's designed to get someone's attention today. And that's important. And there's a lot of great marketers that we've, uh, that we've branded and worked with and, and businesses that have mastered the marketing game. And you can make a lot of money doing that, and that's great. The difference is, is that when you get clear on the brand and the, the perception that you want to create, that is looking at how you want to be perceived over time. Right. And so when you define that, then it kind of gives you some direction on how to go to market, what you say when you go to market, um, how you look when you go into your marketing. So it's like they're, they're related, but they're distinct. Uh, and, you know, I always like to say this, particularly when I'm working with a lot of um, businesses who've mastered the digital marketing game, is that a lot of times that is, that is reactive and it's also, uh, you're sort of predisposed to testing and evaluating and making sure that, you, that you're looking at what's working, what people are clicking on and whatnot. When you define the brand and when that gets dialed in, you, you increase the probability of the success of your marketing campaigns because it's speaking to a direct audience 
And it's coming across in a perception that is designed to tap into both the conscious and the subconscious of your target audiences. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love branding. I'm, I'm a big fan of it, but I know that a lot of people kind of put them in the same bucket and, and obviously they're clearly two different things. Um, so it's, it's, I find it helpful to have someone like yourself explain how they are two distinct animals uh, and, and, and kind of walk through that process. So speaking of the process, like, Explain what the branding process looks like, like with you guys or what, what a common dental practice would go through. Yeah. So the, the process, and then, like I said, whether it's a dental practice or whether it's a different type of small business, the process that sort of I, I've adopted over the past seven years really kind of comes from the, the Fortune 500 branding approach. Uh, it's the same process. There are some nuances perhaps that might be distinct for a particular business. And I can talk a little bit more about that, but at a high level, uh, typically in, in the branding process, you want to think of it in terms of five phases. Uh, we have a whole visual for this, but I'm going to do my best to sort of articulate okay. this. But your first phase is really trying to understand the current landscape of your brand, i.e. the perception. What's working? What's not working? What are some of the things that that, um, that you could improve upon, but it's sort of doing an evaluation and an audit of your current brand. The second phase is now that you kind of know what's working, what's not working, you wanna get clear on the positioning of your brand. Now this is important because most people go straight into what should my logo look like? Right. I'm not even talking about your logo just yet, I'm talking about how do you, how do you position your brand distinct from all the other? Differentiate. Yeah, exactly. So there's a whole set of things under positioning, but that um, w positioning and the term brand platform, having a brand platform that's documented into a 30 page Bible, if you will, that looks at what, who you are, what differentiates you, what is your voice, your message, your personality, uh, how do you call all of your different marketing properties, um, what are the messages that you need to communicate that appeal to your target audiences? So there's a whole series of things that go into positioning. Right. Phase three is really what some people might refer to as the fun phase. I mean, it's the creative phase it, that is really creating a, what's called a visual identity. Now this is distinct from a logo. It's actually creating a look and feel. So if you wanted a logo, you can get a logo this afternoon, right? You can go on 99 designs and get a logo, but when you create a distinct look and feel, that cuts across all of your communications from, and looking at the logo, the color palette, the typography style, the whole visual system, you wanna do that as part of phase three and then create, create brand guidelines such that if you're working with different designers on different applications, you can be consistent with your brand across all of your marketing. Right. Phase four is what we refer to as your brand activation. And activation is like, okay, now that you've built the system, now you're clear on the positioning, now you want to go to market and you want to focus on the high priority items that is where your target audiences are and what's going to get the best ROI for your marketing efforts. Obviously, everyone should have a website <laughs> for the most part. You know, there's social media, but for some people, they might be doing events or trade shows or Facebook ads. But whatever the priority marketing channels you are, that's where you activate the brand. And when I say activate, it's kind of like that's going to be informed with design, copy, messaging, all that sort of stuff that sort of feeds into and form those marketing channels. And then the last phase, the fifth phase is, is important, but most people sort of forget about it once they go through the branding process. Once you go through the branding process, it is kind of a one and done sort of thing, but it is an ongoing process such that if I'm saying that your brand is a desired perception, you want to be able to manage your brand over time to make sure that you're getting the perception back that you want. And you might need to course correct, you might need to add, you might need to evolve. Um, in some industries that I've worked with where it's a highly saturated industry, uh, some of our clients they'll brand and then everyone else is sort of copying and modeling what they're doing. And so if you're a market leader, if you're an innovator, if you're an industry disruptor, you want to then rebrand or refresh your brand such that you're still maintaining your position in the marketplace and that you're looking current, you're looking ahead of the pack. So that's kind of like the linear process of branding. But, you know, that being said, 
that's a linear process. Branding is, is nonlinear because it does look at sort of your brand, your business in the context of the market in which it's operating. I've always, I've always looked at branding as kind of becoming self-aware of like who, who you really want to be, who you are and who you want to be. I find that a lot of clients we work with, they don't really know. They, they kind of have an idea of maybe they want this kind of client or that kind of client, but they don't really know how to speak to them. And so they hope that the marketing will do it at some capacity, but they don't really, they don't do a lot on their end, I, you know, from the messaging they put out and, the, and, and what they want to convey and how it looks. Um, they, they kind of expect that the marketing company is going to handle all that. And that, that a lot of times has to come from them in a, in a, in a lot of these cases on, on, with the help of someone like yourself. Um, so, you know, anytime we work with a client that, that does have that in place, things always go a lot smoother because we know exactly what our target audience is, yeah. who we want to market to, what the messaging needs to be. And in a lot of cases, they figured it out within that specific market as well. They, they figured out, you know, here's who we can attract based on the demographics of, of what whatever's going on socioeconomic issues or whatever. Uh, and, and so that's, that, that always seems to kind of help us out a lot. So, uh, you know, I, I, I always recommend, you know, anyone using someone like yourself, it's only going to help things. So uh, what would you say, like, how, how could a dentist go about branding themselves strategically, especially like uh, I would say if they're looking to acquire more than one location or as they grow and, and build out into multiple locations? So, uh, so that's kind of a loaded question. So I want to unpack that question, right? So if you're, you know, a dental office and you're looking to expand and you want to brand yourself strategically into multiple locations, right? So one, uh, you know, obviously at a very high level, I want to start with sort of like, what's the why, you know, what, why are, why are you looking to do this? Is it to capture more market share? Is it to, and these are more business related questions than branding, but the business questions are really going to help inform the business strategy and the business questions are going to help to inform the brand strategy. Um, so if you're expanding into multiple locations, you kind of want to look at, are you intentionally going to different markets or going to the same market, just different location, right? right? Different audiences, right? So, you know, going to a market in a high end community is very different than going to a market that with more of a mass market community. So you want to look at sort of as you, if you are being strategic about your expansion into different locations, the question you want to ask is why are you going into these different markets? Is it just to crush the competition and, and build more market share? Is it to serve more of the same people or is it to diversify the people that you are trying to appeal to? Right. So I know that this is not as interactive where people are sort of answering that question, but if you're listening in, you're kind of thinking about like, okay, what is it? What are you trying to accomplish from a business perspective? Now, strategically in terms of building that brand, you want to then understand these three questions. It's the who, what, and why. Now I'm sure you probably are familiar with this, Adam, but it's just getting clear on who's the target audience, not just the demographic, but the psychographic. Uh, what's the problem that you solve for them? And then why should they care? So understanding the who, what, and why is who are your target audiences? What's the problem that you solve for them? And then, and then why should they listen to you versus all the other dentists in the neighborhood? Differentiation, right? Differentiation. So, you know, that kind of goes back to what I was saying in terms of phase two, was, which is the positioning, yeah. understanding that now. The next layer to that is when it comes to positioning, you want to look at three filters. You want to look at what is something that you can own. You know, it's got to be something that's credible. Your position has got to be something that's credible. It's got to be something that you can own. The second thing is, is that uh, it's got to be something that is unique in the category. Now, you know, I, I like to use the example of a, you know, uh, Harley Davidson, they're in the business of motorcycles, but their brand is freedom on the open road. Sure. So they're not the only motorcycle company, but if the, you know, so in other words, if you're a dentist, what's your brand? What's the thing that makes you unique? Now, what you want to look at in terms of what makes you unique is you want to look at something that is more of an, an emotional driver. It's above and beyond just being a great dentist. It's like, what's the emotional connection that is is your white space in the category. 
And then the third filter that you want to look at is what is relevant to your target audiences? What is it that they care the most about when they're selecting a dentist beyond just functional and economic reasons, right? Like price point or, or the fact that you're five or two miles away from where they live, right? What's above and beyond that? Again, you want to look at it also an emotional connection. And it's the intersection of what you can own, what is unique in your category and what is relevant to your target audience is where you want to best position your, your brand. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, okay, so you want to apply that and, and, and maybe this is obviously for a, a, a deeper conversation in terms of like, well, what are the pros and cons of going to market as a singular brand versus multiple brands? Because that would be something that I would be wondering is, uh, okay, so you're going to expand it to different locations. How do you, how do you treat the brand such that you're getting the most value and you're building equity towards your brand. So I think the last question I had for you is, what are the advantages of, of, um, of keeping multiple locations under a brand versus uh, separating them out? Uh, you know, having multiple brands, uh, you know, let's say that you've got 20 locations, having some groups under one, others under another versus bringing them all under one potentially. So, you kind of want to look at this as pros and cons of each, right? Because there's no right or wrong. It kind of goes back to the business strategy or what the end game is in terms of the brand. So we have clients that come to us and they want to sell in three years sure. or some of us that, you know, some clients are just like, they're not have no intention of selling, but they want to just expand. So you want, how you want to look at it is like some pros and cons, right? Let's talk about the pros, right? So if you have a singular brand and you are applying that to all 30 locations, right? The big pro is that you're able to leverage the trust that you've built right. with the first brand or the first few brands, right? Uh, the second pro or benefit is that you're able to, to maximize or uh, save time, money, and resources because now you're not starting the branding process all over again you're basically doing a rinse and repeat. Right. Right? Consolidating uh, websites and marketing spend and everything else that comes with it, right? I mean, a tremendous savings potential for just that alone. That's right, that's right. And then the other pro to having a singular brand is that when you're doing all the stuff and you're saving all this money by leveraging all of the energy and activity that you're doing, it makes it easier to sell, right? So if you're trying to sell the business, it makes it easier to sell because now, you have uh, a perception in the marketplace that you've built trust, that you have visual equity in or market equity in. And so that, you know, you kind of bring that to, to the table for sales. Now, obviously you can take all those pros and you can flip them on the other side of the coin in terms of those are some cons. If you were to go with multiple locations, multiple brands, but let me talk about some of specifically the cons when you're going to, um, if you're just having a singular brand, just to even out the conversation. So you have one brand, there are some cons or some considerations that you want to think about. So one, it makes it a bit harder to, if you have a singular brand, it makes it harder to enter into completely distinct markets. So for example, Marriott owns uh, Ritz Carlton and they also own Courtyard. Now, Ritz Carlton is a ma is a high end brand. They don't associate themselves with Marriott because it would actually so they have a lot of freedom to have their own branding because it would actually dilute their brand. Whereas Courtyard is more of a mass market brand, and they need to leverage the trust and the power of the Marriott brand to 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 allow them <laughs> to uh, be a better resource or better uh, lodging place for people. So. The point there, and they all have three different looks and feel, look and feel, <laughs> Marriott, uh, Ritz-Carlton, and, and Courtyard, among many of the other uh, chains. So if you have a singular brand where it's monochromatic, if you will, or monolithic, it doesn't give you the flexibility and the freedom to be able to appeal to very distinct markets. Uh, the second thing is that it doesn't, 
and I don't know enough about uh, the, the, the market to really say this, but I'll, I'll speculate that it might, there might be some negatives being perceived as a chain, right? So if you're kind of in one location and then you're in multiple locations, the downfall is that you might be perceived as not, not having that, uh, that one-on-one or that private, that family feel. And if that's an important driver for your target audiences, then they probably would just find a local dentist and they don't necessarily care that you're in 30 locations. Again, different people have different needs. Some people actually appreciate the fact like, Oh, well I can go here and I can go there. I know what I will get. I know what to expect. I know it's going to be consistent or, uh, you know, I'm worried that they're not going to give me the care that I feel that I deserve. That I deserve. Yeah. And then some people just, they generally like to support non-chain businesses. So, so that would be one of the quote unquote cons, if you will. Uh, I think, uh, I guess the con of, uh, of having a monolithic, I think those are my two primary ones in terms of a con of being a monolithic or, or singular brand. Um, but even the cons, those things can be addressed in the execution of the branding, right? So you could be like Starbucks, for example, Starbucks, you can go to any location and you know that it's going to be the same consistent experience. And so, uh, that could be a really good thing because they've executed in a way that they still make you feel like it's a place where you're comfortable in and it's a place that you want to connect in. And it's a place that you, that you just want to be in. And, um, even though they're, you know, a chain. (laughs) So I think that's how you really want to look at it. If you're really trying to solve the problem of like, well, what do I do? Should I be one brand or should I be multiple brands? You have to figure out what's important to you. What's your end game? If you're going to sell, uh, do you have unlimited budget and resources? Like if money wasn't an object and you had unlimited resources to apply tons of marketing dollars to have multiple brands, then go for it. Uh, you know, if there's different, different uh, business owners or whatever the model is, if it's a franchise model, you know, th- there's some other implications there. So it's kind of a loaded question. I just wanted to get some of the thinking down in terms of how you should be approaching it. Uh, looking at the end game in mind and evaluating the pros and cons. Right. Awesome stuff, man. I appreciate it. Um, I don't, I don't think I have any other questions other than I know that you had an offer that uh, you wanted to extend out to, to our listeners. Uh, can you, can you share with me what that is? Yeah, well, it's just a couple of resources. So whether you're trying to figure out the name of your company or whether you're trying to figure out, you know what we have a we have several resources on our website but let me give you this specific link it's just brandingforthepeople.com forward slash resources so brandingforthepeople.com forward slash resources there's several different resources on there depending on what you need anywhere from how to name your company to what's our branding blueprint like if you want to understand seven different ways to like build a great brand we have a blueprint for that We have different ways if you're doing online marketing, you know, the perfect sales page. So there's a lot of different things that we have in there. Feel free to opt in on that. And if you do take advantage of that, you know, consume the information. Don't just download it, consume it because we promise you we've, it's unlike some other sort of uh, uh, resources that are out there. You could just research online. We've put a lot of intention and care and, and, and insights from working with small businesses over the past several years to apply to you. So if you do, you know, check that out, brainforthepeople.com forward slash resources and, and please say hi and, and let us know that Adam uh, made the connection for us if you do end up um, taking advantage of our resources. Awesome. I, I appreciate you taking the time. I love what you do. I mean, uh, we got a lot of dentists that struggle to differentiate. That's one of the big things that we try to hit, hit them on the head about is that, you know, potential patients don't know the difference between them and the next 30 options down the street. So, you know, if they can work with you and, and, and hopefully with, with someone like us to market that, uh, they can market that differentiation and, and, and tell people why they should do business, why they should choose them for implants or why they should choose them for whatever, you know, their, their family's care. Uh, and, and a lot of it, you know, just drives right back to the, the, the branding and, and the differentiation and all that. So I love what you do. I uh, appreciate you taking the time today. I would encourage Thank everyone you. to reach out and, and uh, 
uh, consume that data, as, as you said, and um, we'll, uh, we'll have more to come. But uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, watching this, uh, and I appreciate you being here. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Bye, everyone. Thank you.